Thanks, Jeremy. Good morning. Nice to see you again. Um, one, I don't know about you, but one of the things I love about having a whole bunch of different Bible readings is um, just picking up different bits and pieces through our chapel that uh, may be unrelated to the sermon, but just learning something new or hearing something unnew. I mean, yesterday, I, I, I don't know if you, you probably all knew this, but it, it sort of struck me uh, new, I think, that the bronze serpent that the Israelites were you know, burning incest to and they smashed the thing. I, I'd never noticed that before. Yeah? You probably all had. Um, but, but just fascinating just to be able to pick up and learn things freshly uh, or completely newly, just having so much of the scriptures read. My, my hope as we come to this part of Colossians is that some of it might be really familiar to us and that we'd hear it uh, anew, uh, but other aspects of it might be heard newly as well. So let me um, pray for us, read the scriptures and then expound them. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we can gather and do business with you like this. And we know that this is, this uh, engagement with you, the God of this universe, and this is a spiritual activity. And uh, Satan would uh, love nothing more than to uh, intervene and interrupt and distract and take us away from that sort of thing. And we pray that, Heavenly Father, you might, by your spirit, help us to learn at the foot of the cross today. We might learn new things, wonderful things, things that might encourage us, lift our hearts about the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So we're continuing on in Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Well, uh, having read this passage in Colossians and the propensity maybe of some of our church services to stand and replace creeds with uh, this very passage... Um, I suppose I can introduce this sermon by reminding you about the difference between infallible Holy Scripture and fallible human creeds. I could talk about the, this Colossian hymn, uh, or the Philippian hymn too for that matter, um, and, uh, and remind you that it should really never be called a creed if it's said in a church service, where the Bible guys remember. I could talk about standing to say, uh, you know, any passage of Scripture, these passages of Scripture, and how it's perfectly fine, actually, to say this Colossian hymn and stand and do that, just as like some churches stand and say a, a, a part of the Gospels. I could even talk about whether it's worth calling this passage a hymn in the first place and tell you a bit about the scholarly debates around that. One commentator says it's a, a veritable academic cottage industry of discussion. But you'll be really glad that I'm not going to do any of that stuff in this sermon, having done it. We, 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 we could talk ad nauseum about those sort of things, but that would actually be to utterly miss the point of this very passage. It would be, indeed, to replace the heart of this passage with a bunch of hobby horses. It would be to move the mediator to the margins. And in that, in, in fact, is precisely what the Apostle Paul does not want his Colossian hearers to to do. They've heard the gospel. The gospel's bearing fruit. It's growing among them and they need to hold on to the gospel. And all this is well, true for you and me. 
And Paul's concerned that they don't get distracted or worse, deceived. And what Paul does here for his Colossian readers, uh, here as that is, and us here this morning, is show them that Christ stands at the heart of the gospel of good news, redemption, forgiveness of sins. He paints an absolutely stunning picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. One I'm not going to do justice to, absolutely not. But he paints this beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to lift our eyes and see Jesus as the, I mean, even just saying these words doesn't capture it, eh? see Jesus as the mediator of the creation and of redemption. The mediator of creation and redemption. In the next few minutes we've got ahead, just a few minutes, my hope is to do the same, just to raise our gaze that little bit more to see something of the glory of Jesus, the mediator of creation and redemption. And in so doing, no doubt inadequately, just to help displace uh, any distractions or worse deceptions that might have crept into our hearts. That's my goal. Verse 15 begins with a string of he is phrases anchored in what he's just been talking about. The son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, well, he calls the son in verse 15 the uh, image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The first half of that verse speaks of the son's unique relation to God the Father, and the second half of it speaks to the son's unique relation to the creation. He's the mediator. He's the God-man who stands as the bridge between God and man. And this was, as you'll know, unless you're in first year and you haven't done church history one yet, uh, one of Arius' favourite sort of concepts to distort and twist. By latching on to that firstborn language, he argued that the son had a created beginning, that he was begotten in time. So there was a time when the son was not. I remember uh, discussing, you might have had similar kinds of discussions, I remember discussing uh, this very concept with some Jehovah's Witnesses some years ago. I was doing uh, MTS at church and I was flatting with a mate who was also doing MTS and a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on the door, so we invited them in. And we had um, several uh, cups of tea, quite, quite a few cups of tea and a long discussion, um, going round and round in circles often actually, um, trying to show them the scriptures teaching about the divinity of the son. Actually, it was quite a funny story. They, uh, it was lovely, actually. They had a great time. They ended up coming to church and, uh, and then leaving promptly afterwards and never contacting us again, which was very sad, but hopefully of some effect. Now, now having come uh, to Moore College as a student, I, you know, could probably now talk a little bit about the Anaphorus Theos, the Colwell construction, as I chatted to Phil Kern this morning about, who, who reminded me that actually, you know, sc scholarships are moving away from some of those things and you know, you can have a discussion about that over morning tea, perhaps. But, uh, you know, learn a little bit about that in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or, or I could talk a, bit, a little bit about the, the prototokos here in Colossians. Because here in Colossians, Paul has the Son's divine preeminence in mind. He has the Son's divine supremacy on view. He wants to say that the sun didn't just pop into existence with creation, rather the sun was the supreme mediator of creation. Verse 16 explains a little bit. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Now, the phrases, things in heaven and on earth and visible and invisible, speak to the totality of creation. And the phrases, uh, thrones and powers and rulers and authorities, speak to the, the spiritual, the temporal realities of creation. So, not just rocks and trees, birds and beasts, men and women, but also angels, archangels, and the whole company of heaven, 
whatever was not but is was made by him who always was. Christ, the mediator of creation. He is before all things, verse 17, and in him all things hold together. Without him, electrons wouldn't keep circling around nuclei. Gravity would stop working. Planets would lose their orbit. Everything is contingent upon Christ. There is, to quote uh, the um, the old Dutch Reformed uh, theologian Abraham Kuyper and Prime Minister too, there is no square inch in the whole domain of existence in which Christ does not cry, mine. All of which means the global plagues, geopolitical conflicts, economic uncertainties and so on, none of these threaten the sovereignty of the sun. Indeed, Satan's schemes, demonic deceptions and the incursions of sin into civil institutions in our society, none of these could supplant the supremacy of the sun. None of them. In fact, the the presence of these natural and moral evils uh, is the very reason why Christ came to be the mediator of also redemption from verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So Christ is not only preeminent in creation, but also redemption. He is the head of the body. He is the head of the church, contra Rome. And he stands at the head of the line of those awaiting their heavenly resurrection bodies. He's leading God's people in the train of redemption. Just like the mediator Moses, hundreds of years before, led God's people out of this uh, wicked place called Egypt that we heard a bit about in the reading today and into the promised land, so too the mediator Christ leads God's people out of this wicked world and into the true and greater promised land. And he did all this, uh, verse 20, through his blood shed on the cross. Through his blood shed on the cross. Just think about this for a moment. That same Christ who in verse 16 created all things, the sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds, the rain, the air, the powers, the rulers, the authorities, that same Christ who holds all these things together, who whilst holding all things together and having the fullness of God dwell in him, spilt his blood on a cross, a cruel Roman cross, having had his physical body beaten with whips, having had his physical body broken in death. Christ, the God-man, who never ceased to hold the universe together, was himself held to a cross and ripped apart. Why? Because, verse 21, he needed to turn you from an enemy to a friend? Because, verse 22, because he he needed to reconcile you to God? Because he uh, needed to present you holy in his sight? Because he uh, needed to make you without blemish and needed to free you from accusation? Well, no, no, not at all. Christ, the mediator of creation and redemption, did not need to do any of that. He could have quite rightly have left you alienated from God and could quite rightly have left you as an enemy of God's. And yet, praise God, he didn't. Rather, 
the creator came into his creation to redeem his creatures. The insider of creation suffered at the hands who would intrude, invade upon creation. The very Son of God lived the life that his creatures ought to have lived and he died the death that you and I deserve to die. And that, brothers, is absolutely extraordinary. Words don't quite cut it. It's miraculous. I mean, I, I was thinking during the Mark reading that we just had, in light of that, what I've just talked about, just imagine being there for Jesus feeding all those people, looking out. Imagine you're there seeing him. Imagine seeing in his eyes that look of, you know, realising the sheep without a shepherd. Imagine the God-man performing this miracle, the one who brought creation into, into existence, just, just making more food. We just, just imagine what that's like, that, that, what that says about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that extraordinary? That's, that's who he is. But even more extraordinary is what he did on the cross through his blood. And you know, Paul wants the Colossians and he wants us to keep Christ at the centre. That's what he wants. You know, the conditional if there of verse 23, it's a form of exhortation to them then and us today. It's not like Paul is trying to throw these Colossians into a bit of a tailspin of doubt and despair, not at all. Rather, he's giving them a, a genuine warning to keep Christ at the centre. To continue in your faith in Christ's glorious person and work. To remain established and firm in your convictions that you're reconciled with this Son of God and at peace to not be moved at all from the hope of being presented on that last day as holy, without blemish, free from accusation, because you're in that son. And Paul says uh, to us in verse 23, well, he says to them then, and by extension us, that's the gospel you've heard. Just, just like he says in verse 6, that, that's the gospel that's come to you. In verse 7, that's the gospel you learnt from Epaphras. And, you know, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it. And, you know, if you've been to more college just for a few months at the start of this year or a few years, uh, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it. You keep on hearing it. And Lord willing, you, you will keep on hearing it. And yet, uh, it's so easy, I know, as you probably know too, so easy for... Christ to slowly and subtly, maybe imperceptibly sometimes, migrate from the centre of our lives towards the circumference. It's, it's very easy to be caught up with other passions, preoccupations, in particular hobby horses, um, good ones, even theological ones, liturgical ones. It, it's possible to be more excited about the debates, about the, for instance, the age of the creation rather than the ancient creator. It's possible to be more passionate about debating the benefits of redemption than loving the benefactor of redemption. It's possible to be here at Moore College and find yourself loving exegesis more than the one who exegetes the Father, loving theology more than the theos himself. And don't hear me uh, wrongly, I'm not, this is not a call to anti-intellectualism, uh, it is right to be excited about exegesis. Mm. <laughs> to go deep into doctrine, some of you are thinking the same. Passionate about philosophy, hugely interested in church history, and rightly so. Massively into mission and ministry and so forth, all of these things, and it's right that we're different people. We've got different gifts. We've got different abilities. We've got different interests. But what is the heartbeat behind all that? What's the base note behind underneath all of those interests? What's really at the centre of your concerns? 
Is it Christ, the creator, the redeemer? Does he have the supremacy in all of these things? Before I uh, left the UK to come back here to Moore College, I spoke to a retired um, uh, theological le uh, lecturer uh, at my church. And I asked him for some top tips uh, about lecturing. I probably could have done with some more, but uh, he, he, he gave me one. And he's, this is the one he said, just one, he just gave me one. I asked for a bunch, he gave me one. It was a good one. He said, keep Jesus at the centre of your life. I thought that was, at the time, I was looking for lots of techniques. Um, but that was pretty good. He said, do that so that whatever you say and do, whatever mistakes you make, the students will know that you love Jesus above everything else. Now, I, I love a good hobby horse. I love to ride some Reformation hobby horses. You know that. But I do hope you know that, that um, I love the Lord Jesus. And I hope that my love for the Lord Jesus is more evident than those things. Um, but what about, what about you? Um, you know, what's at the centre of your life? What's the base note uh, of your conversations? You know, what might your parishioners say? What might they detect or pick up from things that excite you? What would your family or friends say? What is it that reigns supreme in your heart? Let it be Christ. He is the heart of creation and redemption. He's the only mediator between God and man. He's the centrepiece of all of that. And so in everything, my little, you know, doesn't do this passage justice word of encouragement to you this morning is let him have the supremacy which is properly his. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, creator of all that is, redeemer of your precious people, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father from whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, you came down from heaven and were incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. You were crucified for us under Pontius Pilate you suffered and were buried, and on the third day you rose again according to the scriptures. You ascended into heaven and are seated at the right hand of the Father. You will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and your kingdom will have no end. Would you be our vision, heart of our own hearts, whatever befall, still be our vision, our ruler of all. Amen.